What's up, everybody? Today we're going to be talking about pen test story time, my favorite hacks from the past year. My name is Heath Adams, aka the Cyber Mentor, and I am a husband, hacker, military veteran, and day to day I am the CEO and founder of TCM Security, which is an ethical hacking and penetration testing company. On social media, as you can see, I am known as a Cyber Mentor across the board. I do Twitch streaming, I have a YouTube channel, I'm on Twitter. And I'm a Udemy instructor with over 150,000 students. So quickly, why this talk? Well, this talk is going to be about my favorite hacks. And mostly it's going to be about internal penetration testing because that's my favorite thing to do. Although we're going to talk a little bit about external pen testing. And really what I want to do is I want to talk at a high level. This is going to be for people interested in the red team side, the blue team side, and for those who just want to hear stories, so I'm going to try to keep it very high level so that you can understand. And I'll provide resources if you want to get deeper into the weeds on this. But these are going to be my stories from the past year or so. And we're just going to kind of cover what I thought has been really eye opening or educational that I can pass on to you. So the first story I've actually told before, but this is one of my favorite stories. And it's kind of outside the last year, but it's within the last two years. And I think it's very interesting. So I was doing a pen test against a company and we were doing external and internal. So the goal of the external pen test is to try to break inside the network. Once you're inside the network, that is called the internal pen test. So here's a little bit about the story. But before we start, let's talk a little bit about how we got in. So in order to talk about how we got in, we have to talk about something called credential stuffing. Now, credential stuffing takes breached account data. And you can think about all the breaches that are out there. You hear about them all the time. And we take this user credentials. So you can see here we have Joe, ABC123. And this might show up in a breach. So we'll take these credentials and we'll try to pass them along to web servers or anything that the company owns via a website or a login page, et cetera. So with that out of the way, we can utilize tools such as a tool that I wrote actually called Breach Parse that utilizes these breach credential lists. So for example, here I'm using tesla.com, but that's just a pure example, just to show that you these accounts come up in breaches. And what we're looking for are obviously the usernames and passwords for these, but also any sort of patterns. So are we seeing first initial last name? Are we seeing just first name, last name? How are they showing up on the email patterns? And do we see any password patterns or repeat offenders? such as shark at tesla.com, you could see the same password is used twice, just a little bit different. So if I know that, maybe I'm going to try to use this password in some format that includes 907814 and then some variation of DADE here in the middle or anything else where people have been breached on multiple occasions that can give us any sort of indication as to how we're going to utilize that. So that's one part of this attack. So let's go back to the story now. So you just saw the tool that we use called Breach Parse. And all I did with Breach Parse was do some credentials gathering. I took the credentials uncovered with Breach Parse for this company. And all I did was pass them around. And I passed them around to a login form, which I found to be Lotus Notes, which Lotus Notes is very old. OK, so I found Lotus Notes running externally, passed it around, and I did credential stuffing. I took the username, password, threw it at the login form, and wouldn't you know it, I had a successful login. Now, these credentials did not log me into the network. This seemed to be some sort of old credentials that were out there. But what Lotus Notes had on top of it was authenticated password dumping. So as long as we had some sort of valid user, we could dump all the credentials that were in the accounts there. So now, with that password dump, what I'm able to do is I'm able to take the credentials um, and the users that we just discovered and put them into an even bigger list. So I had the breach parse list, but now I've got this huge, gigantic list. Well, I want to pass that new list around too, right? So I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, can I log in somewhere? One place of interest is always Outlook. So any sort of Outlook, they were running their own Outlook instance, but Office 365, any sort of email, it's always good because usually it syncs with Active Directory. So if you have a valid login on Outlook, you're likely going to have a valid login on a VPN. So we like to target things that would sync with Active Directory. Now, nothing ended up working out of this list. But what did we get from using breach parse and using credential stuffing and dumping all these user accounts? We got user accounts. 
we got we can go out to LinkedIn, we can go out to the web, we can scrape and gather as much information as possible, but we're not going to gather everything. And by the time that it was all said and done using breach parse and using the Lotus Notes exploit, I ended up gathering about a thousand usernames just for this company. So I got a thousand usernames and then I think, okay, well, if the passwords don't work that are from historical breach data, well, maybe I can try something like a weak password, something that might be reusable, uh, something like summer 2019 exclamation, perhaps. Uh, something about the season, the year, and a special character really gets people going, and they love to do it. So I performed credential stuffing, didn't work, found the user enumeration, got some password spraying in, and password spraying led to credentials, which led to win on the VPN. So we're able to log into the VPN. Now, we're inside the network. At this point, if I break in externally into a network, I go ahead and do a hard stop. I call the manager, whoever's in charge, and I let them know. So I call up the manager, and here's a text message format of it. But I say, hey, I managed to breach your external network, and I gained access to your VPN. I'm in. He said, OK, well, what level user are you? And I said, well, I'm a low level user right now, meaning I didn't breach a domain admin. And he said, oh, that's it. I'm not too worried then. What can you really even do with a low level account? That was my face. Exactly my face, because I he's taunting me and I wanted to show him what I could do. So let's take this a step further, shall we? So now we're in the network and we can do something called LMNR poisoning. So LMNR is a man in the middle type attack, or this poisoning is a man in the middle type attack. And LMNR itself is used to identify hosts when DNS fails to do so. It was previously known as MBTNS. And really the key flaw is that the LMNR uses a username's user, or a user's username and NTLM v2 hash when it is appropriately responded to. And I'll give you an example here in a second. So this is common. This is out of the box, default, enabled on Windows Active Directory. So we see this quite a bit. Unless a company has been through a pen test before, they typically will have LMNR enabled unless they know better or not to do so. But what it looks like from a high level perspective is you have a victim. And the victim is sitting here and they're saying, hey, I'm trying to connect to a share. Maybe they type in a share wrong or they try to do something and it just can't resolve. So maybe they're trying to connect to this hack me share. They ask the server, hey, do you know where this hack M is because it's mistyped? And they say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And this is a broad example. It can be way more than just a typed or a typo or anything. DNS, just a DNS, any sort of DNS where DNS is failing here, we're going to use LMNR. So what happens is a broadcast message goes out on the network. And it says, hey, does anybody know how to connect to this share drive that I mistyped? And we're sitting here as the hacker, man in the middle, and we say, you know what? I do. I'm going to go ahead and tell you how to get to that location. But first, you got to send me your hash, and I'll get you connected. And the victim's going to send over the hash. We're going to get connected. And that is what is called responding. It's waiting for some sort of response. We respond to it. It sends over its hash. Easy breezy. So with that being said, we very easily used responder, did man in the middle poisoning, and did some hash cracking. Now, what happened? Well, the same manager that I called up and said, hey, I'm on your network, and said, hey, what can you do? Well, we grabbed his password hash, coincidentally. Had to be him. It doesn't make a better story if it wasn't. It's his password. Guess what he is? He's a domain admin. Guess what his password was? His first name with the one after it cannot make this up. You taunt the pen tester, yet your password is your first name with the one after it. It cracked in a matter of minutes. OK, and with that being said, we logged into the domain controller and we won. Now, there's a common theme here. OK, I'm going to click through these really fast because we are going to be short on time. I'm talking as fast as possible to get through all these slides. But you can see that we have password as a theme. When it comes to breach parse, Password rotation and employee training is important because the breach credentials, if you're reusing passwords, that's going to be bad. Password reuse did occur and got us into Lotus Nodes. Also patching because we were able to dump the passwords from Lotus Nodes. Then you get over into OA and you say password complexity because we were able to log in. But more importantly, 
we were able to brute force unlimited amount of attempts, and there was no multi-factor authentication. That's the big story here. There was no multi-factor authentication on Outlook. There was no multi-factor authentication on the VPN, which is even worse. Yeah, you're in the email. That's bad. But now you're in the network. That's even worse. And once we're in the network, password complexity again. Your first name with a one after it, that's terrible. Uh, disabling the LM in our broadcast, that's important as well. Uh, but password, 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 passwords all around here. And of course, once you get into Active Directory, least privilege. So we're getting account credentials when it comes from LNR because uh, we're finding them, we're getting these passwords, and those passwords are being used on the network. Those accounts are being used on the network. In theory, you should only be using a domain admin account to log into the domain controller. And if you're using a domain admin account elsewhere, it generates network traffic. We capture that. We get a hash. We crack it. We log in. That's not least privilege. So that is story one. Lesson learned here. Use multi-factor authentication, OK? Use multi-factor authentication. If multi-factor was in place, we never would have been able to log into the network. We would have had to do some sort of social engineering, somehow get that multi-factor or that key from somebody. But it wasn't there, so we were just able to log right in. Password complexity is important. Don't use your first name with a one after it. Avoid emails as usernames. User training, super important as well, OK? And don't taunt your pen tester. So don't taunt your pen tester. We're here to help you. Don't tell us, hey, what can you really do with it? Um, just let us let us go, understand the importance, and uh, that's the big takeaways here. Now, the stories are going to get more interesting as we go. So I'm trying to save time for the, the bigger and better ones. So let's really get into the cool ones now. So story time. Let's talk a little bit about IPv6. Now, IPv6 is one of the go-to things that I'm starting to utilize in pen testing. It's been my favorite go-to almost for like the last two years. And what it is, is we all use IPv4, right? We're very familiar with IPv4. So if we're using IPv4 in our network, that's very common. Now, when we have a domain or we have something in our environment and we want to use DNS, we're likely using DNS over IPv4, OK? But what we don't do and what we don't really realize is that IPv6 is also enabled in our network. So we have IPv6 enabled by default. And who is really doing DNS for IPv6? Unless we go in here and disable IPv6, or we come in here and we have a DNS for IPv6, we can get malicious. So what we can do as an attacker is we can say, hey, we're going to sit man in the middle, and we're going to say, I'm the DNS server. Give me your credentials. And what I see a lot of times is any sort of login event. So say a regular user logs in, that triggers an event. If we're doing DNS over IPv6, we could take that login event and then relay that to the domain controller. OK, we can do what's called LDAP relaying, get into the domain controller. This will create a new user account or computer account for us. This can dump a lot of information for us. This can do a lot of things, which you're going to see here in a second how robust this can really be by using a tool called Man in the Middle 6, MITM6. And I'll provide some resources here in just a second on learning more about this tool. But IPv6. By default, I would say a good majority of networks are not doing DNS for it. So we can just hop on, run IPv6 or man in the middle 6, do LDAP relaying, and potentially take over the domain controller in just a few minutes. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. OK, so I'm going to show you a little bit of technical stuff from my side. Now, this is we're going to start with a lab environment that I built out. And then we're going to go ahead and talk and show some real world examples. So we just run this tool, man in the middle 6, and we just specify the domain. That's all we have to do. So in this one, I'm running on marvel.local. And here, we run a tool called NTLM relay 6.py. And we just specify, hey, where is the domain controller? And what are we going to do here? We're going to set up a fake WPAD. And we're just going to say, hey, I want to specify a loop me folder, which you're going to see here in a second. And now we're just waiting. We're waiting for something to happen. So say, for example, that a non-admin user event occurs. Let's say somebody logs into the network that is a non-admin user. Here we have a non-admin user of Marvel the Punisher. 
you could see that they logged in and succeeded here because they authenticated. So they have valid credentials. We're sitting man in the middle. We relay this to the domain controller. It succeeds. And what we can do is we can dump out this loot directory. So I specify loot me as a loot directory, and we can get all sort of information. We haven't hacked anything per se yet, but we can get domain computers, domain users, domain policy, domain trust, all sorts of things. Here's an example of what that looks like. You can see here that I can see the domain administrators, uh, enterprise admins, who the administrators are. I can see descriptions, which I see passwords and descriptions all the time. I would say 15, 20% of, of the time where I dump something out like this, there's a password stored in the description. So if you're a domain admin and you're watching this and you see, or you're setting uh, passwords in your descriptions, please stop doing that because I will find it or your pen tester will find it. So here we get information, right? We can see passwords and descriptions. We can see when passwords last set, what the flags are, when they last logged in, what their SAM name is, all kinds of information. Now, let's say that a domain admin user logs in. Well, when a domain admin user logs in, we can utilize that domain admin user to actually create a new account on the domain. It actually adds the user to enterprise admins and we log right into the domain controller as this user, it's over, okay, this is over. So DNS, IPv6, this relaying, it's very quick way to take over a network. I've seen it happen in as little as five minutes. Here's one for example. Here's a hospital we were pen testing, uh, got domain administrator in five minutes. I've tried to blur out everything here. You could see that we were able to relay a user. This is up a little bit here, but we were able to authenticate as a user. That user was a domain admin. We were able to create the user, modify a ACL, add the user to enterprise admin, and then here we had a username and password. All we have to do is log in with this to the domain controller or use something like secret dump and just dump out the information. This is it, it's over. Other stuff that you can do, different hospitals, same results. We can authenticate and sometimes we don't authenticate as the domain admin, but we can authenticate and get some sort of delegation rights. So it doesn't give us full domain admin rights, but we actually create a computer instead of a user. So this does it all automatically. We create that computer and we can actually impersonate. So you see a dash K here. We can actually use a ticket, a Kerberos ticket to impersonate and log in. Here is an example of where I use this ticket to log in as a uh, domain admin on a specific machine. Um, I was able to also dump secrets. Here's a SAM dump of a specific machine as well using a Kerberos ticket. So there's a lot of different things that we can do just because IPv6 is enabled in a network. Again, if you have no idea what I'm talking about because of pen testing is not your background, your bug bounty, you're just getting started, that's okay. This is very high level. That's why I just want you to take away from this that IPv6 enabled in your network can be very bad. Here is mitigation strategies or here are mitigation strategies where we see that um, turning off IPv6 could disable or prevent this attack, but it could also have unwanted side effects. So this is for you domain admins. If you're curious about mitigation, here's this. I'm not going to cover it. It goes way too technical in detail. So a couple things I want to point out. If you're interested in reading more about this, if you Google man in the middle six or MITM six and you Google Dirk, just Dirk, you don't have to do with the rest, but Dirk Janum is a great resource. It covers a lot of these attacks, how they work, way more technical detail. I also have a video on my channel called Domain Admin via IPv6 DNS Takeover. You can hear the walkthrough, see the walkthrough, see how it's done. And you can even set this up on your own if you want to try it out in your network. So I'll provide the tools and resources in this video if you're curious to learn more about it. Okay, on to the next story. So this client is also a large hospital and they had deep pockets. Now they have spent a ton of money on security. They had intrusion detection prevention in place. They had AV antivirus on all devices and they had CyberArk. So CyberArk is a privilege access management tool. If you've never heard of that, basically what it does is it allows users to log in and check out credentials. So say you're a domain administrator and you want to log in, you go check out your credentials and those credentials are only valid for eight hours. Once those credentials expire or you check them back in, 
those credentials rotate and they're usually like 15 to 30 characters in length and really hard to crack, really hard to do anything with. If CyberArk's in the environment, it kind of stops us in our tracks in a lot of places. However, I still managed to take them down. All right, so we use something called SMB Relay. So if you remember earlier, we utilized a tool called Responder to do the LLMNR poisoning. That was the first example. Now, with LLMNR, you have the option of taking that hash, going offline, and cracking it, or you have the option to actually relay that hash. So in order to relay a hash, we can utilize SMB, but SMB signing must be disabled on the target. This says SMB must be disabled. SMB signing must be disabled on the target. And the relayed user credentials must be admin on the machine for it to be of value. Uh, they can be non-admin, but you don't get a lot out of it. So what we're doing in this environment is we're in an environment now where SMB signing is disabled. If we get LMNR, which was all over the place in this environment, we are getting hashes. But remember, that CyberArk was in place. If the password is 15 to 30 characters long, we're not cracking it. It's just not happening. So we needed to think outside of the box. And what came up with is, hey, SMB relay. If we can't crack the password, why not pass the password or relay the password and say, hey, we are this user. Go ahead, don't verify that we are because that's what SMB signing is. SMB signing says, hey, are you really who you say you are? But because it's disabled, uh, by default on host, not on servers, just on host, we can utilize that to our advantage. So we can relay some credentials. And you see here that we did a HTTP relay. We actually did this with NTLM Relay X, just like you saw in the other man in the middle six example. A lot of these tools play well with each other. And we were able to dump out the SAM. So we're able to dump out the hashes on the machine. Now, look, the administrator, and tech support and tech support two. There's also user two, user three. Um, user two, user three have the same hash value. Tech support, tech support two and administrator have the same hash value. Okay, they're reusing hashes here. If your administrator hash and your tech support hash are all the same, guess what? I'm taking these hashes and I'm gonna try to pass them around the network. I'm gonna try to crack them. I'm gonna see what you're using here. So I take these, I crack it, by the way, it comes out to power 10, power 10. That's it. That's the password. And this password was utilized as well on the antivirus. So I was able to disable antivirus on all machines I logged into because they utilize the same password. No bueno, not good. Now, every time you see pwned here is a machine in the network that is being owned because the password is being used or that admin account exists on this machine. So we went from relaying credentials and signing into one machine, dumping password hashes, and now here we are on this machine, or we relay these across the network, and we're just logging into all over the place, all kinds of access, all kinds of owns, okay? And within a few minutes, we come across an account on a machine, we dump the hash, we're able to log in to that using a hash. We don't even have to crack the password. The password, by the way, was welcome one for a local administrator that is used on a domain controller Please don't do that. Okay, so lessons learned. SMB signing should be enabled on your network. Uh, least privilege is important. So your users should not have access, administrative access on machines. If all the users in that environment were utilizing uh, low level access, they didn't have domain admin or not domain, just regular admin, local admin access on their machine, the relay would never would have worked. We never would have been able to dump the, the hashes out. Account tiering as well, because, for example, you should have, again, the domain admin only log in to the domain controllers, and Bob, if he's the domain admin, should have a Bob account and a Bob-DA account that he only logs into his domain admin uh, with, or domain controller with. So account tiering is important. And oh yeah, don't reuse passwords. Super bad. Why do we do this? I see it all the time. All right, and this is my favorite story from the past year which is called Digging Deep. Now, we're, again, at a large hospital. Come on, you already knew. We're three for three on hospitals here. This hospital had no LLMNR. IPv6 was disabled. Everything was patched. Looked really good from uh, an environment. So what options do we have in that case? If the man-in-the-middle attacks aren't working, everything's patched, we don't really have an exploit, 
we have to think outside the box. So we have to dig deep. All right, so what I did was I started looking around the network. I started looking for different websites in the environment. So you can use different tools to do that, but basically you're just hunting port 80, port 443, seeing if there's any responses and going to them. What happened was I was going website to website to website, and this was a large, large hospital environment. They had a lot of websites. Most websites did not have default credentials. All it took was one. Okay, all it took was one. And we logged in and plain text, sitting here in plain text, it says local administrative password. You can see the 70, I blurred the rest. Now this had nothing to do with the environment itself. This had nothing to do with the network. This was just a local admin password stored for something to do with this application itself. Now, why it was stored in clear text, I have no idea. That's on the application, that benefited us. On top of that, the application had default credentials. It was just something they were testing out. It was nothing that they were even utilizing in their environment. They were just testing it out. They used this password. Okay, we start there. Certainly, they wouldn't reuse that password. We haven't seen that in the past, right? Well, I don't know anything about the environment yet at this point. So I just say, hey, crack map exec, which is what we used previously. And just I want to see if the user administrator had with this password could log in anywhere. So I'm just sweeping across the domain, seeing if there's anywhere where this user has administrative access. And wouldn't you know it, there's one machine, one machine in the entire network where this works. Okay, log into that machine. Yeah, yeah, this is how I felt by the way. Log into this machine and you could see that we have the administrator user when we dump the SAM hashes. We have the administrative user, but we also have this other admin user and wouldn't you know it, it's the same password hash. Look at that, which means what? It's the same password. So now we have a little bit more information at our disposal. There's this admin account. What if we pass it again? Oh, we passed it again and we saw everything light up, okay? So again, just like the example you saw, pwn, 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 guess what? This is one of those other tech support type accounts where they were utilizing all across the network locally. So we have this local account and we're just passing it along. We're getting access to machines. You can see here's the authority system where we logged in on the network. And eventually we just keep going around dumping credentials. So this environment itself was using Windows 7. Windows 7 is known for having something called W Digest. Now W Digest provides your credentials in plain text. They are stored in plain text. You can see here's fall 2016 with three exclamations. I told you people love this password. And there's this whole other one here, which I wouldn't have guessed. I don't think we would have actually cracked this one, but you can see it says IS setup, which was actually a service account running in the network, running as domain administrator. Now you take this domain admin credential, you take it to the domain controller, you log in and guess what? You're on the domain controller and you've owned the domain. So we took it from completely no access, seemed well patched, had no LMNR, no man in the middle capabilities and just one configuration, one default creds that were out there. If there were no default creds on that page, we would have never owned this, this network, okay? Uh, without the default creds, wouldn't got there. Default creds were stored in plain text. If they weren't stored in plain text, wouldn't have got there. If they didn't reuse that password on the network, we wouldn't have got there. If they didn't reuse that password with a different account, we wouldn't have got there either. And if they weren't using Windows 7, we wouldn't have got there. There's a lot of chain events here that happen in pen testing. And it just is sometimes where you have to dig deep and you find these weird paths and you get there. And this is just another example of, you, you have these things on the surface where just one little mistake or one, one tiny mistake across the board can lead to something bigger. You take one default credential login on an account that you weren't even worried about because it was just an example, it was just something you were demoing, and that went all the way up to domain admin access in a network. It happens. This is real life. It happens. Now, I know I went through this fast, and I did that because I wanted to share a bunch of these stories. 
So if you have any questions on this, feel free to at me on Twitter at the Cyber Mentor. You can ask questions. I'll be happy to respond. I'll be available the next hour or so in chat as well if you want to ask more questions about anything that you saw. And of course, I'm very responsive. So please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, doesn't matter if it has to be today, but just feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to answer questions on this specifically. Hopefully this was valuable for you. This is the end of the presentation. I, I really do hope you found value. Again, just big key takeaways. Use multi-factor authentication. Use strong passwords. A lot of this where we saw throughout the whole thing had to do with passwords, right? We got in externally because of weak passwords or reused passwords. We've owned machines internally because of reused passwords or because you want to be a jerk and also use your name as a, as a password. Um, and we saw local admin accounts just take down networks, enterprise networks with millions of dollars in spent in security. In, in one of the examples with the CyberArk and everything else, local admin. Local admin is so important. Everybody forgets about it. You can spend so much money protecting your domain credentials that you forget about the local administrator. Local administrator will kill a network. As you see here, will kill a network. There are times where I don't ever access a domain account until the very end, and it's because of that local administrator. And in fact, we never access a domain account in the third example. So keep that in mind. Local accounts can take you down as well. So if I want you to take away these big takeaways, Passwords are important. Utilize multi-factor authentication. Remember your local accounts exist and do not reuse passwords on local accounts. If you're using privilege access management, store those as well and don't taunt your pen tester. That's it for this talk. I really hope you enjoyed it. Again, I'll be around for the next hour or so. Thank you so much.